Hi there, I'm Jeremy Krug, and in this video we're going to take a look at one way to determine the heat change for a system. And like I mentioned earlier, we're going to be looking at several ways to calculate the change of heat in a system or for a chemical reaction. Now, this is the experimental way. Now, the equation that we're going to use for this is Q equals mc delta t. Now, when we have this equation, Q is the variable that represents the amount of heat that's released or absorbed by the system. And that's going to be given to us, or we're going to have to calculate it in joules. And so if you see a value in joules, well, that's going to be your, your value for Q. Now M represents the mass of the object, and that's just going to be in grams, and so that will probably be given to you in the problem. Now C represents the specific heat capacity of the material. Now this is a constant, and it's a constant that's different for every material. The specific heat capacity is normally given to us in joules per gram degree Celsius. And it has what seem to be funny units. Most constants have funny units. This is just telling us how many joules it requires to raise one gram of that material by one degree Celsius. So that's the specific heat capacity. Sometimes it's just shortened and called specific heat. That's the, the same thing. Now delta T is the change in temperature of the material. So if, for example, you're going from 10 degrees to 30 degrees, that's a change of positive 20 degrees in that uh, material. That's just final minus initial temperature. If it goes from uh, 50 degrees to 100 degrees, that's a change of positive 50 degrees. If the temperature goes from 70 degrees down to 10 degrees, well that's a delta T of negative 60. So if the temperature drops, you have to realize that, that is a negative delta T. Now let's back up here for a second and talk about specific heat. When I say specific heat capacity, a good way for us to think about that is to imagine specific heat capacity as a way to describe how well a material resists temperature change. How well a material resists temperature change. So here I have some sp uh, specific heat capacity values for some common materials. Now to illustrate this, let's just imagine that we have a, a pot of, of, of water and you're going to boil that on the stove. And so you turn on a gas stove or an electric stove or something and you have the, the water on the, on the stove in the pot and about 30 seconds after you turn the pot on, or after you uh, turn the stove on rather, you touch the bottom of the pot. Are you going to get burned? Probably a good chance you will, right? Because that metal that's in the pot heats up very, very quickly. Now on the other hand, let's say uh, that you do the same thing, take 30 seconds after you turn the, the stove on, but this time you stick your finger in the water. Are you going to get burned? Probably not. And that's because water heats up much more slowly than the aluminum or the metal or the copper does in, in the pot. So this corresponds to specific heat capacities. Water heats up very slowly and it, likewise it cools down relatively slowly. That's why it has such a high specific heat capacity. It resists temperature change fairly well. On the other hand, take a look at these things like aluminum or iron or uh, copper. These are materials that are found in cookware, right? Because these materials heat up very quickly, they cool down very quickly as well. And so generally speaking, the materials that are on the bottom of this list, things like lead and gold and honestly almost all these other things here, these are considered good conductors of heat. Whereas the matter or the materials that have the higher specific heat, these are going to be considered insulators. So water is actually a very good heat insulator. Ice is actually a very good insulator of heat as well. Perhaps you've heard of igloos. And that's uh, one of the reasons why they would build an igloo out of ice. A, a very good insulator to be honest. Now sometimes you may have a specific heat capacity and these are given to you in joules per gram degree Celsius, but the problem might want you to convert this to joules per mole degree Celsius. If you're asked to do that, this is just a simple gram to mole 
calculation, just a simple conversion. And it can be converted very simply. If you do that, then you have what's called the molar heat capacity. So specific heat capacity is given in grams. The molar heat capacity will be in joules per mole degree Celsius. We're going to work a couple problems with these uh, equations or with this equation, Q equals MC delta T. We'll see how this is done. A 60.0 gram piece of aluminum metal experiences a rise in temperature from 20 degrees Celsius to 52.5 degrees Celsius. If the specific heat capacity of aluminum is 0 0.897 joules per gram degree Celsius, how much heat energy was absorbed by the aluminum? So once again, we're going to use Q equals MC delta T, and we're just going to plug and chug into this equation and solve. So Q is for heat, and that's what we're being asked to solve for. It says how much heat energy was absorbed. So we're going to solve for Q in this problem. M represents the mass of the aluminum, and the mass is 60.0 grams. So I'm going to plug that value in for M in this equation. Now the C is specific heat capacity, and the problem tells us that that value is 0.897 joules per gram degree Celsius. So I'm going to plug in that value for C, and then delta T is just my change in temperature. Since it went from 20 degrees Celsius to 52.5 degrees Celsius, that's a rise of about 32.5 degrees Celsius. So that's my delta T. Now, I just have to multiply, and I can solve for Q fairly simply, and I get an answer of about 1,750 joules. So that's a very simple problem involving Q equals MC delta T and the heat absorption here. Let's try another problem. Silver has a specific heat capacity of 0.233 joules per gram degree Celsius. A one ounce bar of silver has a mass of 31.1 grams and an initial temperature of 20.7 degrees Celsius. If 192 joules of heat escape from the silver bar to the surroundings, what will be the final temperature of the silver? So once again, we're using Q equals MC delta T, and we just have to plug and chug into the equation here. Q is how much heat energy is transferred, and here it says that 192 joules are escaping. Now, since we're losing 192 joules of heat, I'm going to write this as negative 192 joules. Now M, that's the mass, and the mass is just 31.1 grams. So that goes in there for M. Now C is our specific heat capacity of this material, and that's 0.233 joules per gram degree Celsius. So that value goes in for C. Now the delta T, change in temperature, the problem doesn't come right out and give me that value, but it does tell me that the initial temperature was 20.7 degrees. Now it doesn't tell me what the final temperature was, but I know that delta T is final minus initial. So I'm going to plug this in as the final temperature, T sub F, I'll call it here, minus the initial temperature, which was 20.7 degrees Celsius. So now I just have an algebra equation to solve. So I'm going to start by isolating the variable. So I'll take the negative 192 and divide both sides by 31.1 and 0.233. When I do that, I get negative 26.5 equals T sub F minus 20.7. And so now I can just add 20.7 to both sides. And I get an answer that T sub F equals negative 5.8 degrees Celsius. This is a reasonable answer because if heat is escaping, that means that the temperature should be getting colder. It should be going down, shouldn't it? So that's what happens here. So this, this is the correct answer for the problem. Let's try one more problem. And this one seems to be perhaps a bit more complex. We have a 5.00 gram piece of iron that is heated in an oven and then dropped into a cup containing 155 grams of water at 21.0 degrees Celsius. 
the specific heat of iron is 0.449 joules per gram degree Celsius, and the specific heat of water is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. If the temperature of the water rises to 22.9 degrees Celsius, what was the initial temperature of the hot iron? So it seems like there's a lot going on in this problem, isn't there? Well, let's think about this in terms of what's happening in the heat transfer. Would you agree that when you drop a hot piece of iron into a cup of cold water, that the temperature of that iron is going to drop, isn't it? And likewise, the temperature of the water is going to rise. So we have a heat transfer here. The heat that is lost by the iron is equal to the heat that's gained by the water. That's what the first law of thermodynamics tells us. However much heat is lost by one material is going to be gained by something else. So if we agree that that's the case, then this little algebraic statement is correct, isn't it? This is just saying that the heat, or the Q, that's lost by the iron is equal to the heat that's gained by the water. That's just a simple algebraic statement of that fact. Now, we also know that Q equals mc delta t. And that is an equation that I can use to make an algebraic substitution in here. For the Q, I'm just going to plug in mc delta t. So I have this equation that I've just basically derived. I have the negative mc delta t for the iron is equal to the positive mc delta t of the water. So now I just have to plug and chug and I can solve for the missing value. Now m is the mass of the iron, isn't it? So it says it's a 5.00 gram piece of iron. So I'm going to plug in the negative m or that negative 5.00 grams in that slot right there. Now c is the specific heat of the iron and it says it's 0.449 joules per gram degree Celsius. So that goes in there for C. Now let's think of the delta T for iron. That's the final minus initial. Now the problem doesn't come right out and tell us what the final temperature of the iron is, but I think we can figure it out just from the information given to us here. We said earlier that the temperature of that hot iron is going to drop, isn't it? And the temperature of the cold water is going to rise. So where are they going to equilibrate? Well, right in the middle, right? Somewhere in the middle. So the final temperature of the iron is equal to the final temperature of the water. They're going to have the same final temperature. And the problem tells us that the final temperature of the water, it says it rises to 22.9 degrees Celsius. So for delta T of the iron, it's going to be, you know, final minus initial, 22.9 degrees Celsius minus what I'm solving for, because that's what I'm trying to find. What was the starting or the initial temperature of the hot iron? So now I can go to the other side of the equal sign. The mass of the water is 155 grams. So that goes in there for M. The C, the specific heat of the water, is 4.18 joules per gram degree Celsius. So that goes in for C. And now the delta T of the water, we see it rises from 21.0 degrees up to 22.9 degrees. So our delta T is going to be 22.9 minus 21.0, which you can figure out is 1.9 degrees Celsius. So now we just have an algebra problem to solve. So on the left side here, I'm going to multiply negative 5.00 times 0.449, and that gives me negative 2.245. I'm going to leave this expression here as it is. On the other side, when I multiply these values by each other, I get 1,231. So now I can divide both sides by negative 2.245 as I'm trying to isolate that variable, and I get that 22.9 minus the initial temperature equals negative 548.3. So now when I subtract 22.9 from both sides and do a sign change, 
I find that the initial temperature of the iron block is about 571 degrees Celsius. So there's a lot of chemistry going on in this problem. There's a lot of math. You have to know quite a bit, but this is a very typical laboratory type problem where you could determine the initial temperature of a block of metal based on this heat test that you have here. Very, very common laboratory experiment that, that you could do in AP chemistry. Now, when we talk about these problems and these experiments that we're talking about in these, in these three examples here, you might wonder, how do we carry them out? Well, these experiments are carried out in a little object called a calorimeter. And a calorimeter essentially looks like this. We have a cup and we try to use some sort of an insulating material. To be honest, the best and cheapest insulating material that we can use is honestly just polystyrene or what most people call styrofoam. So you have a styrofoam cup and a cover on it. This kind of looks like a coffee cup. So sometimes we call this a coffee cup calorimeter. Uh, works pretty simply. We just uh, stick a thermometer in the top of it and have perhaps some sort of a stirring object in there. And that's how we carry out the experiment in this calorimeter. And when we measure heat transfer through this method, it's called calorimetry. And one thing that you might notice is even though this styrofoam cup might be closed, it's not actually sealed out. This container is, is really unsealed because air can still get in and out of the calorimeter. And this is even more so the case in our everyday chemistry labs where very often we might not even have a styrofoam cover on the top. We might let the styrofoam cup just be left open. This is called constant pressure calorimetry. Now there is a different type of calorimetry where everything is all sealed up. That's called constant volume calorimetry, but that type of calorimetry is not uh, is actually not, not addressed in AP chemistry, but that is uh, something that we'll have to save for a different day. So I hope you enjoyed and learned something from my video about Q equals MC delta T. If you did, please slam that thumbs up button, and I, and I hope to see you in my next video where we move on to unit six, section five.